Karnataka State Park Council Law Academy online lecture series. I would like to extend my humble greetings to the esteemed dignitary, guests, advocates, law students, and all the participants who have gathered virtually here today. After the enriching session of day one, we have now successfully arrived at day two of the online lecture series on Civil Procedure Code 1908. I'm sure the participants must have learned a lot from the previous session and are eagerly waiting to hear more from our distinguished dignitary. We look forward to your constant participation till 13th November 2020, and all the participants can log in from the same meeting ID and password at 5.30 p.m. daily. Before we get started, I request the participants to post their questions, if any, in the chat box. We will be taking it up during the question and answer session. And now, it gives me immense pleasure and exultation to welcome back our esteemed dignitary, Honorable Justice N. Kumar, retired judge of High Court of Karnataka. Welcome, sir, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Yesterday, I was dealing with the jurisdiction of a court to try all suits of a civil nature. Today, I'll be dealing with two important fundamental aspects of civil law, namely, what is known as sub and res judicata. Now, when we say the court has jurisdiction to entertain a suit of civil nature, probably all of you are aware, sometimes this provision is abused. If you have a legal right, and if that right is infringed, there's a remedy. Legitimately, you can approach a court of law for the result. That is the whole object of this procedural code. But sometimes it so happens. Some litigants and their lawyers are a little more enthusiastic. When you come to court, you don't choose the judge. Whoever is the judge has to decide your case. He's a human being. All the time, it is not possible for you to persuade him to accept your viewpoint. And all the time, you may not have an excellent case also. These are the limitations in which the legal system functions. Say, for example, a suit is filed, an application or injunction is filed. You very badly need an injunction order, ex parte, added to of temporary injunction, it is not granted, emergent notice is ordered. Many people do not have the patience to take that order as it stands. Sometimes, if the lawyer has assured the client that is bound to get an order and is going to get an order, he is disappointed. Therefore, sometimes we have come across cases where, where in a place there are more than one course. They make an attempt to get the very same order by filing one more suit. Take, for example, Bangalore. We have city civil court. About 80 courts are there in city civil court. And we have about 10 courts in the Mayo Hall unit. It was a practice. You file a suit here. If you don't get an order, Go on, file a suit in Mayo Hall and try to get an order. Somehow, hook or crook, you must get an order. Well, the question is, is it a practice? Argument is, I have to survive in the profession. What is wrong about it? Of course, both sides, it could be argued. Yesterday, I made a point. This legal profession is a noble profession. A lawyer is an officer of the court. He is a part of administration of justice. He is there to assist the court in administration of justice. He's a friend. If you look at it from that angle, yes, you cannot abuse the process. You cannot file more than one suit for the same relief and take chance before judges. But it does happen. Money is involved. And sometimes that is the way to success in the profession. That is why I said, don't blame the CPC. It is the abuse of the process CPC by the members of the bar, and sometimes also the judges, which is the cause for all these things. And it is not something a new thing. Please be clear about it. Properly, even that was the position, even in 1908, when CPC was framed, the framers have taken care to meet such a contingency. The only thing is, either a judge or the opposite party should be aware of this provision, and to see that such a trend is contained. So therefore, in section 10 of the Civil Procedure Code, you find a 
remedy to such abuses of the procedural code. It is known as principle of res sub judice. It is incorporated in section 10 of the civil procedural code. So for a proper understanding of this particular provision, let us read the section itself and then try to understand human nature as it is. We have not progressed anything at all. No court shall proceed with a trial of any sort. Mark the words, with a trial of any sort in which the matter in issue is also directly and substantially in issue in a previously instituted sort between the same parties or between parties and of whom they or any of them claim litigating under the same title where the suit is pending in the same or any other court in India have jurisdiction to grant the relief claim or in any court beyond the limits of India established or continued by the central government or having like jurisdiction or before the Supreme Court. So this section speaks about a previously instituted suit and one more suit instituted for the same purpose with the same parties where the issue is directly and substantially an issue and the court is competent to grant the relief sought for. So this is a provision which a lawyer should know. Even an attempt is made by a person to abuse these provisions of the civil procedure court, when they try to play with the courts, this section empowers the opposite party as well as the court to prevent such abuses. Because section very clearly says, you cannot have parallel proceedings for the same relief in two courts. It is totally unacceptable. You choose a court, take the relief. If you don't get the relief, go to the higher courts. You cannot start parallel proceedings because if you start parallel proceedings, both the courts are presided by two judges. There is a possibility of conflicting judgments and waste of public money in having public time and money in having trials in two suits for what purpose? Therefore, the public policy demands such parallel proceedings should be curtailed and the rights of the party should be decided only one suit. There is no prohibition for instituting a suit. The prohibition is for trial of the suit. The second suit shall not be tried as long as the first suit is pending for the same relief between the same parties. Therefore, to attract this particular provision of law, what are the ingredients to be satisfied? First, the matter and issue in the suit is also directly and substantially an issue in a previously instituted suit between the same parties or the privates. So this is the first condition. Secondly, that the previously instituted suit is pending either in the same court in which the subsequent suit is brought or in any other court, then the question of allowing the second suit to proceed will not arise. And the third condition to be fulfilled is where the previously instituted suit is pending in any of the courts and such court is a court of competent jurisdiction to grant the relief applying the subsequent suit. If these three conditions are satisfied, then that court before which the second suit is filed has the jurisdiction and the power to stay all further proceedings. That is, stay of trial. Therefore, this rule applies to the trial of a suit and not to its institution. And that is the reason why, as there is no prohibition in law, a lawyer could always argue, I can file a number of suits. What is prohibited is trial of a suit. Perfectly all right from the perfect perspective of a lawyer and a client. What I am trying to say is when we are talking about speedy justice, satisfactory justice, access to justice, and when a lawyer is said to be the officer of the court, what is his duty? Is he doing it without the knowledge of this provision? Or is he doing it with express knowledge of this provision? And therefore, at any rate, if you do it, don't blame the CPC for delaying disposal of cases. Don't blame the administration of justice. If you don't follow the rules of the game, you have no right to comment on others. Therefore, 
this provision categorically states that the trial of the second suit should be stayed and that is a public policy but sometimes it so happens in practice the second suit is taken up probably by a judge who is very anxious to dispose of the matter and ultimately a decree is passed the question is when that suit should have been stayed and it is not stayed trial has gone on and judgment has come is the judgment and nullity answer is no the second suit is to be stayed if for any reason it is not stayed and a decree is passed after the trial it is not a nullity and cannot be disregarded in execution proceedings therefore the whole object of this provision is to prevent courts of concurrent jurisdiction from simultaneously entertaining and adjudicating upon parallel litigations fine for the same cause of action for the same subject matter and for the same relief to the same parties and to avoid recording of conflicting findings on issues which are directly and substantially in issue in two suits therefore my appeal to the youngsters is a literal interpretation is one thing understanding the object behind this you are conducting yourself in a manner befitting of a lawyer a professional is another thing therefore when this provision was enacted in 1908 it probably means earlier such people were there such occasions were there the law took note of it and this provision was introduced therefore under section 10 a suit may be stayed on fulfillment of the following conditions one there are two suits one previously instituted and the other subsequently instituted so two suits they are not filed on the very same day one in point of time earlier another in point of time later the matter in issue in the subsequent suit is directly and substantially in issue in the previous suit that is the most important criteria that is where a prevention of parallel trials is expected three the parties to both the suits are the same the parties are different section 10 has no obligation and when you are seeking for stay of a subsequent suit on that day the previous suit should be pending for example the suit is filed subsequent suit is filed other side takes time objections filed by the time it comes up hearing the previous suit is dismissed then this the section has no application on the day the court is going to pass a stay of further proceedings in the subsequent suit previous suit should be pending and most important the court in which the previous suit is pending has jurisdiction to grant the relief claim in the subsequent suit if that court has no jurisdiction to grant this relief in section is can is not that is both the courts are competent to grant the relief the party wants in both the suits then only section 10 is attractive and then sometimes it so happens in one case father may be there and son is claiming under the father in another suit wife in another suit or a person who has purchased the property in the suit so they may be claiming title under the person then also section is attractive therefore this section has a purpose to achieve a public policy is involved stage of public money public time avoiding of conflict in decisions a lawyer and the party trying to test the ability of a judge to do justice all is involved and for a proper administrative justice this tendency of trying to take chances before courts merely because there are more than one course is to be prohibited is prohibited and it is prevented at any cost therefore the section is there in the statute book if a lawyer is conscious he should not file a suit assuming he files a suit because there is no prohibition and what is thought to be state is only a trial because you may say i'll file a suit i'll get an out of injection if i have not got there i'll break it here the other part should bring it to the notice of the court 
the conduct of the flight conduct of the flight because he did not get a injection here he goes and files a suit in another case he has obtained an order to do and if the court were to accept this position then it is a play game and show sure the judges would see through the game and will not permit such maneuvering in court proceedings and they will take suitable action because it is said what is stayed is the trial then the question is it happens in practical because section 10 doesn't say i file an application in the first suit former suit for an injunction suit is for declaration let us say injunction not granted emergent notice order so i file one more suit whatever little alteration i make it and i seek for an injunction there also notice is on sometimes it so happens by nature some judges are lazy some are very fast now the question is in which court i should move for injunction is there any prohibition in my requesting the court where the subsequent suit is filed to take up my application for injunction is it prohibited answer is no what is prohibited in the subsequent suit is only the trial of the suit the court jurisdiction to hear the application is not denuded by virtue of this section the whole object is avoid a parallel trial avoid a conflicting decision but in both the courts if my ia is not considered what should happen to the litigant and how what will the explanation the lawyer will give therefore the courts have held what is stayed is only trial court a trial of the suit but the court jurisdiction to hear an application in that suit and decide that application and merits is not you know these are all some practical aspects which you come across in uh, day to day life and therefore though the law prohibits the trial of a subsequent suit when a former suit is pending where the matter is directly and substantially an issue in both the suits with the same parties and the both the courts are competent to grant the relief this interlocutory matters could be heard could be decided because section cannot contemplate we see in real life sometimes what happens that's why the supreme court said sometimes it so happens the farmer should no progress is made maybe that is in a court where uh, thousands of cases are pending there is an additional court where there is no not much of a case so this case is there so that judge out of enthusiasm says come on you go on with the trial the trial is not there i will decide it first and if he decides and parties agree that judgment is not a nullity then the earlier suit will lose its efficacy and that is to be stated so therefore though in principle this is the fact in practical life we find a lot of uh, difficulty in this now the real test for section 10 is the next section res judicata if a judgment is pronounced in one suit if that were to operate as a res judicata in another suit that is the real test that is the ground for staying the proceedings if the courts have not competent to grant the relief then this principle has no application so therefore they have arranged it in such fashion section 10 stay the further proceedings they stay the trial and then when it come to section 11 they say the suit itself is not binding because in the case of res judicata a trial has taken place a judgment has been passed and it has attained finality and you cannot file one more suit for the very same relief so that is the principle under section 11 so before section 11 10 is there to prevent the trial of a suit when a former suit for the same relief with the same parties is filed and that court is competent to grant the relief sought for so therefore sometimes it so happens for section 10 to be attracted this condition should be fulfilled therefore the question is when these conditions are not fulfilled but the result is the same whether the courts have inherent jurisdiction to grant stay and the answer is in the facts of that particular case if the case is not covered under section 10 courts have the power 
to grant stay of the subsequent suit because the object is to prevent trial. Sometimes it so happens. If both the cases are in the same court, that is the very day. What the judge is expected to do is club both the cases and conduct a common trial. Sometimes it so happens in a different court, an application is moved to the district court for transfer of one case to another court so that both the cases are in the same court because the question of producing documents will arise and examining the same witnesses will arise. And these are some of the ways and means which in practical application courts have done. Club the case, it is the same court. If there are different courts, get the case transferred to the one court and then have a common trial and see that conflicting judgments do not emanate from courts. Courts time is not wasted in holding parallel trials. And certainly the cost of mitigation is also considerably reduced if one trial takes place. But there are some exceptions to this. If a suit is pending in the foreign court, then the section 10 has no application. Section 10 has no application where you cannot treat a suit in a foreign jurisdiction as a previously instituted suit within the meaning of section 10 of CPC because their CPC itself is not a trial. There the procedural law of that land will apply. Here the procedural law is different and therefore section 10 has no application. The second type of cases where this has no application is summary suits. You know, a regular suit is a long cost suit. That word is not used in Karnataka, but they use it in Maharashtra. And we use the word summary suit. In a summary suit, the way the evidence is recorded is different. Issues are not framed. Points for determination is formulated. Evidence is also not recorded verbatim. In which event, there is no question of staying the procedures. For example, say a suit under Section 30, Order 37 of the Civil Procedure Code. It is a peculiar suit where only negotiable instruments or con admitted contracts are involved and in the money suit. And to contest a suit, one should seek leave. A special procedure is prescribed under Order 37. So you cannot say if that suit is filed earlier and subsequently another suit is filed for as a long cost, the subsequent suit cannot proceed further. Then, as I said, what is prohibited is trial. There is no prohibition for the court to hear and take up interlocutory applications and pass orders. And if such orders are passed, they are all valid orders and you cannot have a grievance merely on the ground that it is a subsequent suit. So broadly speaking, this is based on sound public policy. Merely because there is no prohibition for filing more than one suit, in my view, a lawyer should not embark upon it. Assuming that a youngster or some persons who are specialized in this branch only, or persons who know how to get entry orders uh, by any means, then the other side should be careful enough to see that such suits, at any rate, trial is not commenced by filing this application, bringing it to the notice of the court. Then the efficacy of the system, and then nobody will blame the civil procedure court because it is an inherent provision in the civil procedure court itself. Now, the next stage is that is, they prevented the trial. In the case of restudicate, a trial has been done. A judgment, a case is heard and finally decided. And probably it has attained uh, uh, finality. The question is can you file one more suit to get over the effect of the earlier suit? So it is that circumstances which is now dealt with in section 11 of the plea. Because this is a particularly this adjudicate of plea. You will find in especially in Mokusal pleas, in every suit there will be a plea. Suit is bought by limitation, suit is bought by adjudicator, suit is not maintainable. This court has no jurisdiction. So a standard defense, adjudicate of. So what is adjudicate of? So you must have a clear picture. About it. Section 11 explains what they would have mean by adjudicate. They say, no court shall try any suit or issue, suit or issue, in which the matter directly and substantially in issue has been directly and substantially in issue in a former suit 
within the same parties or between parties in the whom they or any of them claim litigating under the same title in a court competent to try such subsequent suit or the suit in which such issue has been subsequently raised and has been this is important heard and finally decided by such court heard and finally decided by such court that is there should be a end to a litigation and it is our practice suit is decreed or dismissed in the trial court an appeal a second appeal to the high court especially you petition supreme court supreme court throws it out it's a lie which said don't worry i will get you why file one more suit in the trial we yeah, i know can I, i can tell you those days are gone today clients are also intelligent they also understand what we are doing and because the suits are filed there is no prohibition and such suits are pending forever the people will say in the first round it took 20 years now in the second round also it is been filed i do not know when it is going to end and all this is because cpc is providing for it and therefore cpc is bad cpc has not said all these things this is your interpretation it is the interpretation of lawyers if a lawyer worth the name is proud that he is a member of a honorable profession a learned profession is an officer of the court he should think whether i can resort to or i can advise the client to reagitate the matter when there is a provision like section 11 in the civil procedure code which prohibits such a suit if you pay court fee present a claim the court has no option except to take it court has not no already matter is decided it is only when the other side comes he takes up a contention res judicata is a mixed question of law and fact it cannot be tried at the preliminary point it has to be heard along with the other issues so that issues will take its own time so therefore people say cpc is the cause for delay is there any justification for uh, blaming the cpc cpc specifically says such a suit is not maintained if you are respect for law if you understand the law you should not do such things it should be a self imposed restriction don't expect others to force you that's what precisely what these amendments have done when discretion was given to the court when discretion was abused now discretion is taken away from the court lord directs the court to do something i take it is a humiliation now similarly things are happening to the legal fraternity advocates also you are given full freedom do properly now i will show you how the amendment is insulting to the legal profession but we have invited such a thing so please when i look at this it will happen look at it from the anger all it is simple you had a case you came to court you fought the litigation you lost the litigation in one court there is a right of appeal you prefer a right of appeal there is a second appeal you prefer a second appeal all right you went to supreme court because special litigation is available when finally you have lost it you must develop the humility of accepting the judgments in your view it may not be right but that's how the system works if everybody says judgment is wrong there is no finality we are living in a democracy we are living in a society where rule of law is accepted mode of living and if you do not accept the judgments of the courts though it has reached the finality and start the litigation over again where is the end to this you will be wasting your life you are wasting public money and in the process the entire system gets abandoned because people don't understand this they only say case is fine already once on road i have gone to supreme court and i have come back again we are going my lawyer said we will do something and he feels that the earlier judgment is not correct therefore in this proceeding that is going to be correct is it ever possible please see res judicata principle is based on public policy there should be an end to this litigation otherwise there is no point in saying a uh, rule of law democracy constitution all that will lose its value so therefore my appeal to the younger members of the bar the last student sees please try to understand the philosophy behind these provisions no doubt it is a procedural law but this procedural law also has a philosophy underlying it if you are able to understand the philosophy behind this procedural law and then act according to the dictates of these provisions probably we could see a better judiciary
you will see any number of cases on this adjudicator and how much time is wasted and good for nothing. So therefore, the first and the foremost requirement a lawyer should bear in mind is the public policy requires that there should be an end to litigation. If any lawyer were to say there is no litigation, how are we going to survive? I'm telling you, it is a mature way of doing this. Today, people are not coming to court. They are fed up. The day courts can grant relief expeditiously, the litigation will multiply. The cost of litigation in court would be considerably less when compared to the way they are settling this matter outside the court. Enormous cost and there is no justice. So my appeal is, please understand this provision under section 11 has to be understood in a proper manner and the public policy requires that there should be an end to the litigation. By all means, you fight it through the night. But once it has attained finality, you must have the humility to accept it. Advise the client. Well, you are lucky as that, and therefore you have to accept it. Uh, a judge's fate is not in his hand, but we think that he's going to decide others' fate. It is not so. Similarly, a lawyer, your, your fate is not in your hand. As a professional, as a lawyer, you have done your best. And you must learn the humility to accept the final decision and advise the litigants suitably. Therefore, the question whether the decision is correct or not, erroneous, has no bearing on the question whether it operates as adjudicator or not. Even if the judgment is erroneous, there is a finality. And we have to accept it. As I said, if there are any appellate court above the Supreme Court, I am sure more than 50 percent cases would have been set aside. But there is no end to this. There must be some finality. That's the object. Because there is no court above Supreme Court, and that is the final court, we have to accept it. Not necessarily it is correct. Not necessarily it is flawless. There are, there are also human beings. Everybody is a human being. Every is human. But in a system where written constitution is there, a judicial system is there, if there is a procedural law like this, we have to follow the rules of the game. And therefore, this section 11 is of utmost importance in civil litigation that will also put an end to unnecessary, frivolous litigation where the same matter is re-educated over again. Now, <clears throat> apart from public policy, please look at it from another angle. The hardship to the individual and the principle is that he should not be vexed twice for the same cause. That is the principle. And it is also in the interest of the state. That, no, you say we don't have many courts. That is one of the reasons for delay. And if in the courts itself you go on uh, re-agitating the matter, how many courts the state can cost you? So therefore, once there is a cause of action, the law is very clear. If you have a right and the right is infringed, you have a remedy and can approach the court. If it is a civil matter, can approach the civil court. And the civil procedure court provides for a trial, a fair trial. If you are agreed, a first appeal under section 96. A second appeal under section 100 and, 100, and then you can take a chance in Supreme Court by special litigation. Once it is over, that's the end of the matter. You cannot re agitate the matter. In fact, this particular section is based on three maxims, which is accepted not only here, all over the world. What are those maxims? One, none should be vexed twice for the same cause. None should be vexed for this price for the same cause. And the second principle is in the interest of the state that there should be an end to the litigation. In the interest of the state, there should be an end to the litigation. And the third principle is a judicial, a judicial decision must be accepted as correct. Not that it is correct. You must accept it as correct when all the remedies, all venues open to you are exhausted. First, the lawyer should understand this. And suitably, he should advise the client. If the lawyer himself doesn't understand, he has a grievance against a particular judge, but he wants to go on fighting throughout his lifetime. By all means, you can do it, you can earn some money, but let me tell you, by this match, may, may, you will not read the talk of the legal profession. You will be wasting my money, you will be wasting your precious life and time, and you will not read it. Therefore, as I said, 21st century lawyers, please know it. You are impatient, you are fast, you are intelligent, you want results, take the results, and if it is not there, accept it, and then look for something else. 
So therefore, this doctrine of res judicata is founded on the principles of justice, equity, and good conscience. And this doctrine applies to all judicial proceedings and also equally to quasi-judicial proceedings even before the trials. And the section 11 operates not only against the plaintiff, it also operates against the defendant. And therefore, this question of res judicata is held to be a mixed question of fact and law. And if anybody wants relief on that basis, he should specifically plead it. Merely saying barred by res judicata doesn't take you, it is not a plea of mere plea of law, a question of law. It is a mixed question of law and fact. You have to plead in your play, written statement. The success suit has been filed. This is the relief sought for. These are the issues which are framed. This is the finding of that. And then that finding has been affirmed in appeal. Again, affirmed in second appeal. Now, between the same parties, the very same issues are agitated. Please look at the issues which will arise in this case. And therefore, the suit is to be dismissed as on the ground of rejudicator. So not only you have to plead this, how will the court come to know whether it's a rejudicator or not? That's a mistake people commit there. Sometimes they simply file a copy of the judgment in the earlier proceeding. That is not sufficient. If you want to succeed on the plea of rejudicator, not only you should plead exhaustively in your written statement and see that a particular issue is framed, then you have to prove that issue. How do you prove it? You have to produce the copy of the plaintiff. You have to produce the copy of the written statement. They should be marked. Then you have to produce a copy of the issues framed in the earlier suit that will show what are the issues involved in that. And then you must produce a copy of the judgment. And if it is an appeal, a judgment of the appellate court. And only when the court looks into all this, then it will be able to make out who are the parties in the earlier proceedings, who are the parties in the present proceedings, what are the issues involved in the earlier proceedings? What are the issues involved in these proceedings? And then whether that court was competent to grant the relief, and then this court is also competent to grant the relief. And then if all turns out to be correct, then the court may say, no, this suit is hit by the principles of the judicator. Therefore, it is not that easy to prove even the plea of judicator. To prove the plea of judicator, these are all the requirements. Now, there is one exception to this. That is, you have seen section 42, 43, 44 of the Evidence Act. The 44 of the Evidence Act specifically says, if a decree is obtained by fraud or collusion, it is not a nullity in the real sense, but it is it could be invalidated. The question is, if in the earlier proceedings, a decree is obtained by fraud or collusion. Now, if that is produced as a, in support of a plea of res judicator, can the court act on it? If the plea as against those decrees that it is a collusive decree, it is obtained by fraud, then it is not necessary for the person to challenge those decrees and get it set aside. If he is able to establish in the present proceedings itself, is obtained by collusion, is obtained by fraud, then that plea of adjudicator will not be available. Otherwise, if you are failed to show, if you fail to prove fraud, if you fail to prove collusion, and there's an earlier decree between the same parties, same subject matter, then it operates as a adjudicator. Sometimes it so happens, a suit is filed for a declaration that the decree obtained earlier is obtained by fraud. Then the question is, the plaintiff himself has produced the earlier proceedings. He says the issues are the same, parties are the same, it has attained finality. Is the suit maintainable? Sometimes I have seen plaintiff rejected on the ground of adjudicator. It's not a correct way of doing things. When I plaintiff challenges an earlier decree on the ground of fraud, collusion, and doing claims. It cannot be a rejudicator. If he fails to establish it, then it will go. If he fails to establish it, the court has the power to set aside that earlier decree 
on those blocks. So therefore, when we apply this principle of res judicata, we must be careful about the defense taken, the nature of the decree which is relied upon, and then whether this plea of fraud, section 44 of the Evidence Act is to service. Sometimes it also happens, a plea which is available under order two rule two, that is, if you are entitled to more than one relief, you have to seek for all the reliefs. If you do not seek all the reliefs, in a subsequent suit, you cannot claim that relief. That is different from res judicata. That is not a case of res judicata, that is a case of a plaintiff is precluded from seeking for some relief which he could have sought earlier. Order 2, Rule 2 applies in a totally different sphere when compared to Section 11. Then there is another concept. Res judicata and estoppel. What is the difference? Res judicata is sometimes treated as part of the doctrine of estoppel. That is, you cannot file one more suit. But the two are essentially different. Estoppel is a part of law of evidence and prevents a person from saying one thing at one time and contradicting it later. While res judicata precludes a man from going the same thing in successive litigation. The operation of the doctrine of res judicata is the transformation of the question of fact into a question of law. So basically, this is what the principle of res judicata, and it is a very complicated branch of civil law. And if you are able to master this particular subject, it will be very useful, and you can cut down many litigations where people try to abuse the process of court. Now, this seven explanations. So when we read this section with the explanations, probably you will understand the scope and ambit of this particular section. Explanation one says, the expression former suit shall denote a suit which has been decided prior to the suit in question, whether or not it was instituted prior there too. In section 10, former suit means a suit instituted prior to the present suit. In section 11, the date of institution of the suit is immaterial. Date of institution of the suit is immaterial to understand whether it is a former suit or not. A former suit shall denote a suit which has been decided. Which if two suits are filed, and if one suit is decided, and that suit where it is decided is the former suit, don't look into the day on which it is filed, and the question is decided, and the same question is agitated in another suit, that suit is hit by the doctrine of the judicator. So therefore, the word former suit has to be understood properly. Now, we have some practical difficulties in this. Sometimes, Two suits are filed, club, common judgment. Sometimes two suits are tried together, separate judgments. Now the question is, when there are two suits and two decrees, judgment is the one, two decrees. Appeal lies only against a decree. And the person prefers appeal only once one decree and does not prefer an appeal against another, what is the position? The judgment is the same. Some judgments have said, if you don't prefer two appeals, one is hit by the doctrine of res judicata. When two separate judgments are filed, same thing. But of course, ultimately it depends upon the facts of the particular case. We have to see, sometimes in war enthusiasm, these things happen. There's another point. A preliminary decree is passed. You see section 97 of the civil procedure code. Against a preliminary decree, an appeal lies. There's an error in the preliminary decree. Appeal is not filed. Then application of final decree is filed. Final decree is passed. Against the final decree also an appeal lies. And in an appeal filed against the final decree, the question is whether that court can correct the error in the preliminary decree. Answer is no. The principle of the adjudicator applies. Though there is an error in the preliminary decree, it is not challenged. It has become final. It has attained finality. 
This final decree proceedings is a different proceedings. Say, for example, the final decree court, because it cannot go behind the preliminary decree, passes a final decree in terms of the preliminary decree, which ought to be. Therefore, there is a mistake in the final decree also. When an appeal is filed against that, the appellate court has no jurisdiction to meddle with the preliminary decree because it has become final. Because the principle of adjudicator applies. That specifically says so in section 97. Then the question is heard and decided. That's the word used. What do you mean by heard and decided? What about an ex parte decree? In an ex parte decree, the other man was absent. Where is the heard and decided? So does it mean an ex parte decree will not apply as a uh, the adjudicator? Answer is no. There was no prohibition for the other man to contest the matter and get a judgment on merits. You did not come. So therefore, for default, a decree is passed. It is a decree. Merely because it was an ex parte decree, in no manner the value of it is less. Therefore, an ex parte decree also will operate as a final decree. Uh, sorry, a, a, as a adjudicator. So these are some of the things which you have to keep in mind when understanding the meaning of the word former suit, that is explanation one. Explanation one makes it very clear. When we say former suit, don't look into the institution of the suit, look into the day in which the decree is passed. Earlier decree operates as a adjudicator in a subsequent suit. Now, as far as explanation two is concerned, it talks about the competence of a court. If the court passed the earlier court, uh, earlier decree and the subsequent court where the suit is filed, they are not competent to grant the very same relief, then the adjudicator will not apply. Because only if a judgment delivered by a competent court in a former suit will operate as an adjudicator in a subsequent suit. Here, again, the section 44 has a role to play. Because section 44, the Evidence Act lays down that when a judgment is put in evidence under section 40, 41 or 42 of the Evidence Act, it is open to the party against whom it is offered to avoid its effect on any of the three grounds specified in the section without having it set aside. Namely, one, if he is able to show that decree is passed by a court which is not competent to pass the decree, then it will not operate as a duty. So, Earlier suit where a decree is passed should be by a court which is competent to pass the decree. Two, that it was obtained by fraud. So one need not file a suit to get the decree set aside. I'll keep quiet. When it is sought to be used against me, I attack it on, by showing that it is fraud. And if I am able to establish fraud, the decree goes and will not operate as a judicator. Similarly, the collusion. If collusion is established, then th that decree will not operate because it is not heard and decided. In a collusive decree, there is no heard and decided. By consent, decrees are passed. Therefore, section 44 of the Evidence Act is an exception to section 11. 44 of the Evidence Act is an exception to section 11 of the CTC. Then, explanation three. That is, the matter which is the subject matter in a former suit should have been alleged by one party and denied or admitted expressly or impliedly by the other. So when you want to know what is substantially an issue, necessarily you have to look into what is the allegation made in the earlier suit. That's why plaint is to be presented. You can't imagine things. You can't imagine on the basis of the evidence. But now an issue arises when a material fact is alleged and denied. What is that material fact alleged? To look into it, the plaint is required. So, therefore, a particular material fact if it is alleged in the plaint, and if it is denied by the other side, and then an issue has arisen on that particular fact, then it could be said in the subsequent suit, the same thing happens that is, that was directly and substantially an issue. Otherwise, no, because that issue is more important. And only when that issue in the earlier suit and the subsequent suit is one and the same, between the same parties, then only the principles of the adjudicator applies. Now we have this uh, explanation for a very interesting uh, explanation. It is called as constructive adjudicator. Constructive adjudicator. 
and let us see what is the public policy behind this. Any matter which might and ought to have been made ground of defense or attack in such former suit shall be deemed to have been a matter directly and substantially in issue in such suit. The principle is this, you have come to court, you have four grounds to support your claim. A claim is put forth. To defeat that claim, you have four grounds. In order to see a proper judgment is delivered and there is no repetition of this trial, you must state your case, take out your grounds, everything at once. You can't take out in installments. Similarly, defense also should not be in installments. Assuming you had a very good defense or a good point in support of your claim, you don't plead. You lose the battle. Appeal, second appeal. The question is, case is heard and finally decided. This question was not heard and finally decided. Therefore, can you file one more suit? And when that plea of adjudicator is pointed out, you can say, look, this allegation was not there. This defense was not there. This issue was not there. How does it, how can it operate as litigation? If that argument is accepted, there is no end to the litigation. People with money can ruin the others. If you have four more rounds, file one suit, one one ground, take a chance. If you don't succeed, file one more suit with another ground. So never ending. Therefore, this explanation four makes it very clear. If you had a ground which you ought to have taken, if you have not taken, you did to have taken and lost. Wonderful principle. Therefore, this section draws no distinction between the claim that was actually made in a suit and the claim that might have, ought to have been made, might have or ought to have been made. If the parties had an opportunity of controverting it, that is the same thing as the materially actually controverted and decided. The word might refers to a possibility where the plaintiff has an opportunity of putting forward a particular ground of attack or defense. He is expected to put forward a particular ground of attack or defense. He is expected to put forward the same. The word ought, on the other hand, enjoin the party to take such a plea and is used in a mandatory sense expressing duty or obligation. Therefore, that's why here the role of an advocate comes in. You must take proper instructions, know the facts, plead all that is available. If you are filing a defense, plead all the defense available. Don't play with the court. Don't play hide and seek. Don't say, let me see future. That's why amendment applications are also there. All right. If you have forgotten, amend the claim. Put forth that claim. Amend the return statement, put for the defendant, but don't keep it back for a future litigation. It is not permissible. Even though you have not pleaded it, if it was available to you, the doctrine of constructive justification of prohibits you from pleading it, and it says it is deemed to have been pleaded, it is deemed to have been decided, and that's the end. Therefore, constructive adjudicator is a very powerful defense, sometimes available to, it only shows lack of experience sometimes, which is the root cause of all these things. Otherwise, with the change of lawyers, new grounds go on coming. There is no scope for it. Till the decree is passed by all these amendments, once that is done, it is the end of the day. You cannot start a, a fresh proceeding on fresh grounds on the ground that the earlier lawyer did not know, and this was not argued before the court, this was not argued before the court. This is what you should have done it. It is deemed to have been done it, and deemed to have been rejected, and that's the end of your case. Then we have what is called as explanation five. You claim several reliefs. The court grants some reliefs. Some is rejected. Sometimes it so happens it is neither granted nor rejected. What is the effect? Can you file one more suit for that relief about which the court is silent? This explanation five says, any relief claimed in the plain, which is not expressly granted by the decree, shall, for the purpose of the section, be deemed to have been refused. Another wonderful principle. Suit for declaration of title, recovery of possession, main profits, cost. Suit for declaration decree, possession directed to be given, cost given, main profits, court is silent. 
That means you had to fourth decline for milk profits. Court did not grant your decree. It said nothing. It means it is refused. You cannot file one more suit for the relief of milk profits on the ground. In the earlier suit, nothing has been said. That is not granted. If it is not granted, your remedy is to file an appeal, not to start one more suit. If you don't file an appeal, if you accept the judgment, it means that relief is sought for and that it is refused by court not saying anything. So this is another facet of the judicial. Then we have explanation six. It is something connected with public interest litigation, where persons litigate bona fide in respect of a public right or a private right claimed in common for themselves and others. All persons interested in such right shall, for the purposes of this section, be deemed to claim under the persons so litigate. That's what we call it as public litigation. It is not only Article 226 public litigation. Civil Procedure Code provides for public litigation, Order 1, Rule 8. And Section 11 speaks about public litigation. If the plaintiffs have put forth a claim, either on behalf of the public or behalf of a body of persons given a private interest, and the matter is contested, issues are framed, evidence is recorded, and then a finding is given, even though Everyone in the public is not a party to the proceedings. One of the requirements of adjudicator is the litigation should be between the base parties. Here they are not parties. So that means doesn't mean one more set of people can file one more suit. Then there is no end to the there is no end to the public litigation at all. Five persons, first time they come. Afterwards, 10 persons will come, another 25 persons will come. No. The question is whether the persons who approach the court have bona fide come to court, whether they have pleaded properly, whether the matter was contested properly, and then if a finding has come, it is binding not only on them, even on those persons who are not parties to the litigation who constitute a section of the court. Therefore, for application of this explanation six, it has specifically said what are the conditions to be fulfilled. One, there must be a right claimed by one or more of the persons in common for themselves and others not expressly named in the suit. So it is not a personal case, it is a public case. That the parties not expressly named in the suit must be interested in such right. Not only your interest, they also should be interested in that. That the litigation must have been conducted bona fide on behalf of all parties interested. Because sometimes you find People play are so intelligent. They catch hold of some people, file a litigation, public litigation, claiming to be a litigation. They don't conduct the case properly, a decree is obtained. So when the real persons open their eyes, they know they can put forth this. Therefore, the word is bona fide. If it is collusion decree, if it is fraud, if it is not fought in the manner it should be fought, then it will not operate in the judicial. But if it's a bona fide so properly contested, then, even though others are not party to the suit, uh, litigation, it operates as this litigator. And then, if the suit is one under order one to eight, all conditions therein have been strictly complied with. You look into the order one to eight, there should be a paper publication, there should be a notice, there should be heard. If all those conditions are fulfilled, then it operates as this litigator. Therefore, Public litigation is not only confined to Order 1 Rule 8, even otherwise also a public litigation before a civil court is competent and if it has been conducted properly, it operates as a adjudicator. Therefore, this explanation 6 to section 11 is an exception to the ordinary rule of adjudicator as it is applicable to even persons who are not parties to the earlier proceeding in certain contingencies. Then we have in 1976 amendment, two more uh, explanations were added. What is that? One dealing with execution proceedings. That is, the provisions of the section shall apply to a proceedings for the execution of a decree and references in the section to any suit, issue or formal suit shall be construed as references respectively to a proceedings for the execution of the decree, question arising in such proceeding and a formal proceeding for the execution of the decree. Then the question is, what was the law earlier? 
even before this 1976 amendment where explanation 7 was added generally this principal rectificator was made up with it. by 1976 amendment what they have done they, they expressly said it applies to execution procedures because the word used this so issues they said it also applies to execution procedures so therefore once you take up a contentious execution case something is decided it has reached finality you cannot go on reagitating merely because it is a 12 years period prescribed now for execution procedures then explanation 8 is that the very important one as i said long cause or small cause of it a suit is filed in a small cause court say for arrears of rent relationship is denied it is a simple suit for arrears of rent to grant a decree for arrears of rent you must decide the relationship it has decided it it said he is a tenant this is the rent decree is passed then to recover possession the small cause court has no jurisdiction you go on file a suit in this original suit can in the original suit again can he contend i am not a tenant There is no relationship. This explanation says that finding recorded by a court of limited jurisdiction operates as a rectificator. An issue heard and finally decided by a court of limited jurisdiction, competent to decide such issue, shall operate as a rectificator in a subsequent suit, notwithstanding that such court is limited jurisdiction was not competent to try a subsequent suit on the suit in which. Such issue has been subsequently raised. This is another amendment brought after in 1976. Then, somehow the fallout of this is that is all an issue judgment. What about interlocutory orders? You go on filing applications after applications in the proceedings. Now the question is whether an interlocutory order passed in a suit will operate as adjudicator in a subsequent stage of the same proceedings. Sometimes it operates, sometimes it doesn't operate. But the principle substantially applies. So, for example, a suit for injunction is filed, appointment of a commissioner is filed, order for attachment is filed. The court says no ground made out, dismissed. But subsequent events happens where you can make out a ground which was not there earlier. Court is not helpless. it can in a given case could alter vary modify the orders and pass an orders but if the facts set out in the earlier application and the present application is one and the same then the principles of res judicata applies so therefore there is no hard and fast rule then the next question is res judicata is a very powerful defense can it be waived how this plea should be taken this also has been dealt with a number of cases don't look into the section section doesn't says it is said a plea of rejudicata would not be available for the first time in second appeal that's why i said you must plea issue should be raised and it should be proved it is not a pure question of law it is a mixed question of law and fact it cannot be raised for the first time in appeal similarly a rejudicata not raised before any other court cannot be raised for the first time before the supreme court also now what is the effect of failure to raise such plea where a party fails to raise such plea at the proper stage of the suit or proceeding it would deem to have been waived whether or not there was a waiver of such a plea is to be decided on the facts of the circumstances of each case so therefore the plea of res judicata if it is available and not taken and a decree is passed you cannot say that decree is without jurisdiction it does not affect the jurisdiction of the court to pass a decree if a person does not put forth this plea and prepare to take a decision in the second suit he takes the risk so it is not a question of what of jurisdiction of the court it is a question of the subsequent court where the subsequent suit is filed not granting relief to the person in the second suit so therefore If a party does not raise the plea of adjudicata, it will be deemed to be a matter directly and substantially issue and decided against him. Then section twelve in the background of this plea, section twelve, how comprehensively the CPC has provided for it. Only we have to look into it. That's why it's an in-depth study of CPC is required. Adjudicata is heard and decided. 
There are cases where it is not heard and decided. Will it operate as judicator? Section 12 says, deals with the bar to further sue. What is that? Where a plaintiff is precluded by rules from instituting a further suit in respect of any particular cause of action, in rejudicata is not precluded from filing a suit. What section 11 says is, the court shall not try the suit. Here they say he is precluded from instituting a further suit in respect of a particular cause of action. He shall not be entitled to institute a suit in respect of such cause of action in any court to which the court applies. Which are the cases? One, order two, rule two. Omission to sue in respect of a part of claim. The law is, you cannot file a suit. It is not a question of court dismissing the suit. You cannot file a suit. Now, a suit is dismissed for default with the plaintiff. Order nine, rule nine. Remedy is, file an application and get it restored. If you do not file an application and get it restored, you cannot file one more suit. On the ground, it is not heard and decided. Though section 11 is not attracted, section 12 is attracted, and you are precluded. Even the order 9 to 9 says you are precluded from filing a separate suit on the same cause of action. The only remedy is get it restored. If you don't get it restored, your right is gone. Then, <clears throat> suit is abated. A loss are not brought on record. What is the remedy? File application for setting as an abatement, condoning the delay, and implete. If you do not do it, you cannot file a fresh suit on the ground. In the earlier suit, nothing is heard and decided. Order 22 to 9 bars a fresh suit if suit has abated. And similarly, if you file an application in order 23 to 1, withdraw the suit without seeking leave of the court to file a fresh suit on the same cause of action then you are precluded from filing one more suit on the same cause of action. Therefore, section 10, 11, 12 has a purpose, a public purpose. It is based on equity and good conscience. And a good civil lawyer should have the principles underlying the sections and it could be used, of course. When you are a plaintiff, you use it in a particular manner. When you are a defendant, you use it in another fashion. But this knowledge is very much essential in trial of suits. So I will stop here. Let me see any questions. From sir, there are three questions, sir. First question is whether preliminary decree is to be considered as a defense of res judicata for subsequent suit on same dispute. No, oh, it is. It is. It is. That's sir. what. Again, a preliminary decree and appeal is provided. A second appeal is provided. If you don't exhaust those remedies, it becomes final. It is, read section 97. 97 is an answer to that. Sir. The next question, sir, is what is the difference between matters directly and substantially in issue and matters collaterally and indirectly in issue? I'll give you a small example. A suit for injunction is filed. In a suit for injunction, the only question to be gone into by the court is whether on the date of the suit, whether the plaintiff is in lawful possession or not. So in order to decide whether he is in lawful possession or not, sometimes the plaintiff has pleaded his title. Court will also look into the title and then convince that he is in possession and then grant a decree. Maybe in the course of the judgment, it may say, the plaintiff has produced exhibit P1, the original sale deed, which shows he is the owner of the property. And the sale deed is a recital that he was put in possession on the day. And he has established before me that his possession on the day he filed the suit and therefore is entitled to Now the question is the defendant says, I am the owner. Tomorrow he files a suit for declaration of title and for delivery of possession. Now the question is when in the earlier suit, the court has recorded a finding that under the exhibit P1 he has purchased the property and is the owner, whether that finding will operate as adjudicator in the subsequent suit. The finding that he is the owner was not substantially, directly a substantial issue in the earlier suit. It was collaterally an issue and therefore it does not operate as adjudicator. Sir, there is one last question, sir. Verbatim I would read it. Suit is pending. A is not a party to the suit. A filed an impleading application and the same got dismissed. 
whether a can file a separate suit for relief whether a can prefer revision this is the question sir you wanted to come on record question is are you a necessary party or a proper party if you are a proper party or a necessary party and if you are not impeded you have a right to challenge it in the revision or no the writ petition but if you are not a party and if any decree is passed and if you are not claiming right under any one of the parties to the proceedings then the judgment is not applicable but if you are claiming under any one of them then you are bound by the decree and of course with the leave of the court you can challenge the decree by preferring an appeal even though you are not impeded as a party thank you sir that's all varsha back to you thank you so much sir for sharing your profound knowledge with us and thank you sir for sharing your cr critical reviews what an informative session it was i now take up this opportunity to extend gratitude to our esteemed dignitary honorable justice n kumar and let's not forget the two pillars of the ksbc law academy the president of ksbc law academy shri gautam chand and shri anil kumar chairman of ksbc law academy and the hosting committee of ksbc law academy and all the participants who have extended their support and we look forward for your constant participation till november 13 2020 All the participants can log in from the same meeting ID and password at 5:30 PM daily. Tomorrow I will be dealing. Sir, please be enlightening us on the topic place of suing tomorrow. Place of suing. Yes, Thank you.